Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Ghost Set of Watchmen by Harper Lee, the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. Dane reads. So, obviously this book is pretty controversial. There were rumours going around at the time that it came out that Harper Lee didn't necessarily want, to, want it to be released, but was kind of basically forced into doing it and didn't really know what she was signing. Uh, and also, a lot of people don't like it because Atticus is kind of a little bit older and comes off as a bit of a prick in this, to be honest. But, um... I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, from Harper Lee comes a landmark new novel set two decades after her beloved Pulitzer Prize winning masterpiece To Kill a Mockingbird. Macomb, Alabama. 26 year old Jean Louise Finch, Scout, returns home from New York City to visit her aging father, Atticus. Set against the backdrop of the civil rights tensions and political turmoil that were transforming the South, Jean Louise's homecoming turns bittersweet when she learns disturbing truths about her close knit family, the town, and the people dearest to her. Memories from her childhood flood back, and her values and assumptions are thrown into doubt. Featuring many of the iconic characters from To Kill a Mockingbird, Ghost Set a Watchman perfectly captures a young woman and a world in painful yet necessary transition out of the illusions of the past, a journey that can be guided only by one's own conscience. Written in the mid 1950s, Ghost Set a Watchman imparts a fuller, richer understanding and appreciation of Harper Lee. Here is an unforgettable novel of wisdom, humanity, passion, humour and effortless precision. A profoundly affecting work of art that is both wonderfully evocative of another era and relevant to our own times. It not only confirms the enduring brilliance of To Kill a Mockingbird, but also serves as its essential companion, adding depth, context and new meaning to a classic. Now I don't know about that, I think probably the best way to actually think about this is to try and read it as though it's disconnected to To Kill a Mockingbird and just try and judge it on its own merits, you know? Uh, that's what I would recommend going for, if you can, you know? So let's check out some tabs. So right at the beginning we have this little bit, uh, which kind of shows you, shows you, I guess, uh, the way that times change, but also it's got a little bit of humour in there. She was glad she had decided to go by train. Trains had changed since her childhood, and the novelty of the experience amused her. A fat genie of a porter materialised when she pressed a button on a wall. At her bidding, a stainless steel wash basin popped out of another wall, and there was a john one could prop one's feet on. She resolved not to be intimidated by several messages stenciled around her compartment, a roomette they called it. But when she went to bed the night before, she succeeded in folding herself up into the wall because she had ignored an injunction to pull this lever down over brackets, a situation remedied by the porter to her embarrassment, as her habit was to sleep only in pyjama tops. Luckily, he happened to be patrolling the corridor when the trap snapped shut with her in it. I'll get you out, miss, he called in answer to her poundings from within. No, please, she said, just tell me how to get out. I can do it with my back turned, he said, and did. And uh, this, I guess, just shows some of the social mores and the expectations for men and women in society, you know. Isn't it fairer for a man to be able to see what he's letting himself in for? Yes, but don't you see you'll never catch a man that way? She bit her tongue on the obvious and said, how do I go about being an enchantress? Henry warmed to his subject. At 30, he was an advisor, maybe because he was a lawyer. First, he said dispassionately, hold your tongue. Don't argue with a man, especially when you know you can beat him. Smile a lot, make him feel big. Tell him how wonderful he is and wait on him. She smiled brilliantly and said, Hank, I agree with everything you've said. You are the most perspicacious individual I've met in years. You are six feet five and may I light your cigarette? How's that? Awful. They were friends again. And uh, just a little bit of con more context in uh, Jeannie Louise's family. Of all her relatives, her father's sister came closest to setting Jean Louise's teeth permanently on edge. Alexandra had never been actively unkind to her. She'd never been unkind to any living creature, except to the rabbits that ate her azaleas, which she poisoned. But she'd made Jean Louise's life hell on wheels in her day, in her own time, and in her own way. Now that Jean Louise was grown, they had never been able to sustain 15 minutes conversation with one another without advancing irreconcilable points of view, invigorating in friendships but in close blood relations producing only uneasy cordiality. There were so many things about her aunt Jean Louise secretly delighted in when half a continent separated them, which on contact were abrasive, and were cancelled out when Jean Louise undertook to examine her aunt's motives. Alexandra was one of those people who had gone through life at no cost to themselves. Had she been obliged to pay any emotional bills during her earthly life, Jean Louise could imagine her stopping at the check-in desk in heaven and demanding a refund. And uh, here, talking to her, her aunt Alexandra, she says, um, Auntie, if Atticus needs me, you know I'll stay. Right now, he needs me like a hole in the head. We'd be miserable here in the house together. He knows it, I know it. Our recovery will be far slower. Auntie, I can't make you understand, but truly, the only way I can do my duty to Atticus is by doing what I'm doing, making my own living and my own life. The only time Atticus will need me is when his health fails, and I don't have to tell you what I'd do then, don't you see? And obviously then, that's a little bit of a hint of what's coming along later. And here a little bit of uh, context, historical context on Maycomb, the town in which it's all set. 
Maycomb did not have a paved street until 1935, courtesy of F.D. Roosevelt, and even then it was not exactly a street that was paved. For some reason the president decided that a clearing from the front door of the Maycomb Grammar School to the connecting two ruts adjoining the school property was in need of improvement. It was improved accordingly, resulting in skinned knees and cracked crania for the children, and a proclamation from the principal that nobody was to play pop the whip on the pavement. Thus the seeds of states' rights were sowed in the hearts of Jean Louise's generation. The Second World War did something to Maycomb. Its boys who came back returned with bizarre ideas about making money and an, urge and an urgency to make up for lost time. They painted their parents' houses atrocious colours. They whitewashed Maycomb's stores and put up neon signs. They built red brick houses of their own in what were formerly corn patches and pine thickets. They ruined the old town's looks. Its streets were not only paved, they were named Adeline Avenue for Miss Adeline Clay. But the older residents refrained from using street names. The road that runs by the Tompkins place was sufficient to get one's bearings. After the war, young men from tenant farms all over the county flocked to Maycomb and erected matchbox wooden houses and started families. Nobody quite knew how they made a living, but they did, and they would have created a new social stratum in Maycomb had the rest of the town acknowledged their existence. And um, she's asked what she was doing and what she was thinking about, and she says, I was just wool gathering, uh, which makes me think of Charles Heathcote every time I see that word. Fantastic booktuber, check out his channel if you haven't already. This is a great little conversation between a younger Jean Louise and Atticus. It kind of jumps backwards and forwards through time a bit. So, uh, I don't know what to think of you, Jean Louise. Your father will die, simply die when he finds out. You'd better tell him before he finds out on the street corner. Atticus was standing in the door with his hands in his pockets. Good morning, he said. What will kill me? Alexandra said, I'm not gonna tell him, Jean Louise, it's up to you. Jean Louise silently signaled her father. Her message was received and understood. Atticus looked grave. What's the matter, he said. Mary Webster was on the blower. Her advance agent saw Hank and me swimming in the middle of the river last night with no clothes on. Hmm, said Atticus. He touched his glasses. I hope you weren't doing the backstroke. Atticus, said Alexandra. Very funny. And she was clothed as well, but you know what the rumour mill's like. And uh, we get this. Unruffled by Herbert Jemson's breach of allegiance because he had not heard it, Mr Stone rose and walked to the pulpit with Bible in hand. He opened it and said, My text for today is taken from the 21st chapter of Isaiah, verse 6. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. So that's, you know, where the title comes from. Let me get this. As he turned to go, Jean Louise called to him. Uncle Jack, she said, what does DV mean? Dr. Finch sighed his, you have no education, young woman, sigh. Raised his eyebrows and said, dear Valente, God willing, child, God willing. And we get a reference to some books. Uh, True Detective Mysteries, The Code of Alabama, The Bible, and Palgrave's Golden Treasury. I've got a copy of that somewhere. And I think this is a great start to a chapter here. There was a time long ago when the only peaceful moments of her existence were those from the time she opened her eyes in the morning until she attained full consciousness, a matter of seconds until when finally roused she entered the day's wakeful nightmare. And then we get Francine Owen is pregnant and you know who did it? Her daddy. That's messed up man. We get plenty of N-bombs and stuff uh, as you can imagine with a book like this. And um, so we get this. Claudine pursed her lips. Well, I wouldn't want to get mixed up with all those Italians and Puerto Ricans. In a drugstore one day, I looked around and there was a Negro woman eating her dinner right next to me. Right next to me! Of course, I knew she could, but it did give me a shock. Did she hurt you in any way? Reckon she didn't. I got up real quick and left. You know, said Jean Louise gently, they go around loose up there, all kinds of folks. Claudine hunched her shoulders. I don't see how you live up there with them. You aren't aware of them. You work with them, eat by and with them, ride the buses with them, and you aren't aware of them unless you want to be. I don't know that a great big fat negro man's been sitting beside me on a bus until I get up to leave. You just don't notice it. Well, I certainly noticed it. You must be blind or something. Blind, that's what I am. I never opened my eyes. I never thought to look into people's hearts. I looked only in their faces. Stone blind, Mr. Stone. Mr. Stone set a watchman in church yesterday. He should have provided me with one. I need a watchman to lead me around and declare what he seeth every hour on the hour. I need a watchman to tell me this is what a man says, but this is what he means. To draw a line down the middle and say, here is this justice and there is that justice and make me understand the difference. I need a watchman to go forth and proclaim to them all that 26 years is too long to play a joke on anybody, no matter how funny it is. And we get this little conversation between, uh, uh, between Jean Louise and her uncle, Uncle Jack. So he goes, Dr. Finch pulled his nose. Those people are the apples of the federal government's eye. It lends them money to build their houses. It gives them a free education for serving in its armies. It provides for their old age and assures them of several weeks support if they lose their jobs. Uncle Jack, you are a cynical old man. Cynical hell. I'm a healthy old man with a constitutional mistrust of paternalism and government in large doses. Your father's the same. If you tell me that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely, I will throw this coffee at you. 
The only thing I'm afraid of about this country is that its government will someday become so monstrous that the smallest person in it will be trampled underfoot and then it wouldn't be worth living in. The only thing in America that is still unique in this tired world is that a man can go as far as his brains will take him or he can go to hell if he wants to, but it won't be that way much longer. We get another great line, stop wall gathering and answer me. Yes, Charlie, I'm talking to you. Stop wall gathering and answer me. And then we get this at the dance. So the, again, this is going back into the past. And um, what's the matter, Hank? Don't you think it's hot in there? Let's go out. Jean Louise tried to break away, but he held her close and danced her out the side door into the night. What's eating you, Hank? Have I said something? He took her hand and walked her around to the front of the school building. Ah, said Henry. He held both her hands. Honey, he said, look at your front. It's pitch dark. I can't see anything. Then feel. She felt and gasped. Her right false bosom was in the centre of her chest and the other was nearly under her left armpit. She, ducked, she jerked them back into position and burst into tears. She sat down on the schoolhouse steps. Henry sat beside her and put his arm around her shoulders. When she stopped crying, she said, When did you notice it? Just then, I swear. Do you suppose they've been laughing at me long? Henry shook his head. I don't think anybody noticed it, Scout. Listen, Jem danced with you just before I did and if he'd noticed it, he'd have certainly told you. And uh, basically Henry then takes the false breasts and throws them away. And they end up on like one of the signs, I believe, of the school. And then um, there's a, an assembly, so. And so we get this. When Mr. Tuffet faced them and read some announcement, Jean Louise was grateful that he was killing the first period, which meant no math. She turned around when Mr. Tuffet descended to brass tacks. In his time, he had come across all varieties of students, he said, some of which carried pistols to school, but never in his experience had he witnessed such an act of depravity as greeted him when he came up the front walk this morning. Jean Louise exchanged glances with her neighbours. What's eating him? She whispered. God knows, answered her neighbour on the left. Did they realise the enormity of such an outrage? He would have them know this country was at war, that while our boys, our brothers and sons were fighting and dying for us, someone directed an obscene act of defilement at them, an act the perpetrator of which was beneath contempt. And it's because her bra was discovered. And then we get this, uh, she goes to tell him that, that it, she was responsible. Ah, uh, Mr. Tuffet, she said, I came to tell you, like you said, I, I got him at Ginsburg's, she added gratuitously. I didn't mean any... Mr. Tuffet looked up, his face reddening with anger. Don't you stand there and tell me what you didn't mean. Never in my experience have I come across... Now she was in for it. But as she listened, she received the impression that Mr. Tuffet's were general remarks directed more to the student body than to her. They were an echo of his early morning feelings. He was concluding with a proceed on the unhealthy attitudes engendered by Maycomb County when she interrupted, Mr. Tuffet... I just want to say everybody's not to blame for what I did. You don't have to take it out on everybody. Mr. Tuffet gripped the edge of his desk and said between clenched teeth, For that bit of impudence, you may remain one hour after school, young lady. She took a deep breath. Mr. Tuffet, she said, I think there's been a mistake. I really don't quite... You don't, do you? Then I'll show you. Mr. Tuffet snatched up a thick pile of loose-leaf notebook paper and waved it at her. You, miss, are the 105th. Jean Louise examined the sheets of paper. They were all alike. On each was written, Dear Mr. Tuffet, they look like mine, and signed by every girl in the school from the ninth grade upward. No, I am Spartacus. That's what that reminded me of. And just another really nicely written line here. Hell is eternal apartness. What had she done that she must spend the rest of her years reaching out with yearning for them, making secret trips so long ago, making no journey to the present? I am their blood and bones. I have dug in this ground. This is my home. But I am not their blood. The ground doesn't care who digs it. I am a stranger at a cocktail party. And we get this uh, little bit of dialogue. Hank, we're poles apart. I don't know much, but I know one thing. I know I can't live with you. I cannot live with a hypocrite. A dry, pleasant voice behind her said, I don't know why you can't. Hypocrites have just as much right to live in this world as anybody. She turned around and stared at her father. His hat was pushed back on his head. His eyebrows were raised. He was smiling at her. And then she's there with Uncle Jack and goes, Her uncle began fidgeting with his coat pockets. He found what he was seeking, pulled one from the package and said, Have you a match? Jean Louise was mesmerised. I said, Do you have a match? Have you gone nuts? You beat hell out of me when you caught me at it, you old bastard. He had, unceremoniously, one Christmas when he found her under the house with stolen cigarettes. This should prove to you there's no justice in this world. I smoke sometimes now. It's my one concession to old age. I find myself becoming anxious sometimes. It gives me something to do with my hands. So yeah, all in all, I did enjoy this. I think, I, as I say, if you can read this as not being a direct sequel to To Kill a Mockingbird and kind of judge it on its own right, it's a pretty good read. Uh, and it also has some interesting stuff on like the differences between generations um, and like the complexities of human characters. Like you can be good and bad at the same time and Atticus is an example of that, you know? Uh, and also there was a really poignant scene in this which I thought I tabbed out but apparently not, where um, Jean Louise basically realizes that the reason she's so upset with her father is because this is the first time that their morality has differed. So all the time when she was growing up, you know, she thought that he was just always right. And now that she's a young woman and has beliefs of her own, 
she kind of sees that actually maybe he's not always right all the time, you know? So yeah, I did enjoy it, would give it a 4 out of 5, it's not as good as To Kill a Mockingbird and I don't want to really comment on the circumstances around its publication because I don't really know enough about it. But uh, I would recommend if you've been thinking about picking it up, especially now that like the furor and the hype around it has died down a bit, you know? So there we have it, that's what I made of Ghost Set of Watchmen by Harper Lee. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye